mean magic. And magic as a force in the world is shared by Hello, uh, my name is Irving Finkel and welcome to the first of three new lectures about ancient Mesopotamia at the invitation of Archaeology Now. So the first talk is called Unlocking Secrets of Mesopotamian Magic. And magic as a force in the world is shared by almost all communities that we know about, ancient and modern. It's one of those features of humanity, difficult to describe, doesn't always look the same in all contexts, but it is a universal matter. And it just so happens that with ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq, the very ancient land of cuneiform writing and all that heroic stuff, Sumerians and Babylonians, their inscriptions tell us a great deal about magic as it functioned in their society. So in the course of this lecture, we're going to look at some of the artifacts, the written artifacts and some of the ideas that they had, um, just to give a flavor of their particular angle on magic, which was important and which was something that people didn't just believe in or believed in. It was part of the way things worked. So the first document to be examined is rather unappetizing looking. Perhaps it's a cuneiform tablet from the first millennium BC, written on clay in cuneiform script, rather the worse for wear, sort of haggard looking, that you can see the lines of writing um, that persevere even though there are cracks across the surface. Now this um, tablet is quite remarkable among the 150,000 or 200,000 tablets which exist in the world, because it is a sort of catalogue of all the responsibilities which fell to a certain professional uh, type of individual in Mesopotamia. A person we call a magician is a kind of a, the best word for it. The ancient word is Arshipu, and the Arshipu was the very well qualified, very well trained specialist who was in charge of all of what you might call magic one way or another. And at some point, somebody decided it would be a good idea to write down all these different responsibilities. And actually, it's a rather a good thing, because there are many more extensive variants of what would come under what we might describe as magic that were covered by this person. So this is a little chart to give you an idea that the Arshipu, sometimes called the magician or exorcist, because exorcism, getting rid of evil and uh, so forth, was a main part of their work. It wasn't all by any means. So you can see the first one is consecrating a temple with the right kind of ritual. And he would be called in to make sure there were no evil forces around, to make sure that everything would go well in the future, just to keep an eye on everything. And similarly, when priests were appointed, then he would be there to make sure that they were cultically clean and appropriate for their job. And then there's a different, more wider thing, which is a diagnosis of illness and, and, and distress. Because as we will see, um, illness and being sick and so forth in ancient times were attributed to forces outside of the human body. And exorcising evil, the next category, is one of the functions that this Arshipu would do. He would look at a patient, he would take note of what was wrong with them. Sometimes it might be for the doctor, the, the therapeutic doctor, to prescribe drugs and medicine, uh, and we'll be looking at that in another talk later. But in this case, may, very, very often it was true that there was an evil force, either hanging around the person, lurking around behind them, or even inside of them, which had to be driven out. And the specialist doctor who knew all about drugs very often had spells to go with them, and the Arshapu would be the person who provided them. And you can see evil spells, curses, witchcraft, the evil eye, the evil tongue, all of those were things which this kind of person would be called in to deal with. And of course, there was a lot of literature, some of it very ancient and very powerful, some of it more modern, and all the individuals who did this for a living collected tablets wherever they could. They wrote them out in their own special handwriting, and they had them there as a kind of reference tool so that when they were called in, they'd have the right spell, the right incantation, or the right procedure on the basis of precedent. 
rather like um, lawyers, very reluctant to say anything in public. And if they can open a fat book and read out the same kind of thing that happened once before. And they had specializations too, pregnant women and the question of childbirth, as we'll see later, special plants and special stones. And on top of it all, there was another section of what we call esoterica, with titles like totality of the sources of wisdom and secret incantations, plans of heaven and earth and the abyss. So we have but a very imperfect idea of what those compositions included. They were certainly written on clay tablets by the same sorts of people, studied by them, but I think kept secret because they were regarded as esoteric. And they had this idea in antiquity, I'm afraid to say, which has not gone away in the modern world, that people from one college, shall we say, where magicians were trained, were very reluctant to share things with people from another college in another city. There are examples of this even today in our modern world. So this Arshipu um, was in charge of ship twos. You can see the ship thing um, is the root which gives Arshipu, the man who does incantations, and ship to the noun incantation. So this was his bread and butter kind of material. He always knew where to find the right incantation for the right job. And I thought you might be interested to see this, because if you look in the top left hand corner, you have a sign which on the right has been divided into two. So the one on the right with three wedges is a picture meaning God or heaven. And the one next to it to the left, which has two wedges, is another sign which means something different. And we're not quite sure what it means here, because if you take the first sign and the second sign and write them together, you make one new sign. And that is the sign, the one in the upper left, uh, for spell or incantation. Now, below, there's something rather interesting, because if you look carefully, you will see that the lower left hand corner has the first upright sign and then the one that means God at the end and in between an extra sign. And this extra sign itself, as you will see on the right, is two more of the God signs. So this has the first sign, we'll call it Shu, that's how it's pronounced, plus three signs for God to write ship to incantation instead of just one. Now, in 99 times out of 100, wherever you see the word incantation on a tablet, it is written with the one divine sign. But I found a couple of tablets where the scribe, to write the word incantation, wrote the shoe bit and three divine symbols, which can only mean he thought this was a hell of a powerful incantation, bang, like that, which was squashed any resistance possible, a really high powered ship to. And this is a most unusual example of bigness, so to speak, or power being expressed in a very simple childlike way in the midst of a very sophisticated adult writing system. It's a kind of quirky matter. But anyway, they knew they had lots and lots of incantations. And if a particular case, either something very dangerous or very mysterious, or perhaps in there was a bag of gold to be earned, they would drag out a really powerful spell which would blow the enemy out of the water. So we have all sorts of examples of inscriptions that these Arshipus used. And this is a big example, which comes from a series called Utuki Lenuti, evil Utuki demons. And the Utukus were one of the most troublesome group. As we'll see, there were lots of demons and devils, and some of them were well known, and some of them are just names. But the Utuku... The very troublesome thing. Many, many spells were there to write them out. And what happened was that from the beginning of time when writing was, was first underway and things began to be written down, sometimes even in the third millennium, uh, the beginning of that time, people knew about magic things and they wrote down spells and sometimes 
with the passage of time, people made variations of them, or they made up another one, or they heard of another one from someone else. And there was a currency between professional um, exorcists who collaborated, that's to say the ones in one institution, or one who was on good terms with another institution, they shared these things. And after the passage of time, they were put together in, in sort of encyclopedic works, say 15 tablets or 12 big tablets like this, where all the spells were written out in order and underneath the ritual that might be necessary. So if you have an exorcistic spell to banish a demon and you pronounce the name of a powerful god three times, I pronounce this in front of you, be off with you, be off with you. And then there might be a ritual where you'd have to wear a bit of colored wool around your wrist or some special stones of different properties around your neck or any number of other things and sometimes complicated procedures and modern work on reconstructing this magical literature if they're if the person is very fortunate they have a resource to such a marvelous tablet with many many lines on of course the same on the back so you can see it's a very compendious work and gradually the seriologists pieced together bits from one museum collection or another museum collection and eventually they produce something which is nearly complete if they are lucky and then we can read many many lines of the material which was so important in those days to the magicians now um the thing about um their main enemies is an important matter to clarify because um Exorcism, the art of driving out evil in Mesopotamia, had different focus, foci, focuses, so to speak, of attention, because there were demons and devils, if not a lot to do, which is between them, and then there were ghosts, of course, and then there were witches and wizards, and the difference between them is that the demons and devils, like the one in this picture, were nothing to do with human origin. They were of obscure semi-divine origin. They lived forever. You couldn't kill them. They had no heart. They were very dangerous and altogether a pain in the neck. And they were different from ghosts, as we talked about once before on this line, um, who are, of course, derived from human beings. They're dead human beings in their new form in the underworld, and though they could be very troublesome, and though they could require exorcism, um, they had a kind of residual humanity about them, and they were never quite so frightening. And then you will see about the witches and wizards in a minute. So this is made of um, um, bronze. It's rather the worst for wear. You can see there's a hole in one hand and the upraised hand must have been brandishing something. And it's a lion-headed figure with hair and ears and a kind of tunic. And this was buried in the ground as a prophylactic device to drive away um, other demons. So probably was in fact itself not a harmful creature to human beings, but a benevolent one on our side who could be recruited against evil whom he might well resemble because a lot of images that we do have of this type have lion-headed figures of a human form and wearing clothes and carrying things so it's kind of like for like and there was obviously an understanding that these sorts of defensive characters had more effect on their equivalents than perhaps totally different imagery. So once in a while, we really do get an idea of what ghosts were thought to, um, ghosts, what demons and devils were thought to look like. So this is not a human person, not a, not a ghost, it's something else. And this is a tablet written in about 1700 BC. Um, in Babylonia, southern Iraq, it was never fired in antiquity, and it's not been fired in modern times, because although clay tablets profit from being baked, it makes them strong and they survive all sorts of troubles, when the surface is as flaky and vulnerable as you see in these photographs, um, it's too risky to put them in a kiln and fire them. So this is a magical spell to drive out a demon and the, uh, the the exorcist has drawn at the bottom a picture of his foe. So the one on the right is the same picture, blown up, so to speak. And you can see it's got a kind of triangular, awkward body, spindly legs, and a human-like face. 
Um, the detail is a bit difficult to make out, but what it does tell you is that the guy who was doing this magic, he would be in a state of purity, um, uh, not drunk, not gross, but as far as possible austere and clean, when he undertook this battle and recited uh, on behalf of his client the necessary words and did the necessary rituals, he had a vision in his mind of what his, so to speak, unseen foe would look like if you could bring him out into the light. Because um, it is not clear at all from any inscriptions whether anybody really said that they'd seen one of these demons. It may be there's a passage here or there, I'll have to keep investigating, but in general I think they had a conception of their evil forces which could lend itself to being drawn and depicted and not, so to speak, be a likeness taken from the real figure. Now there are two tablets in this archive both written for sure by the same scribe, both very much for wear. And on the right, you can see a bit more of what this demon looked like. And one of the things about it is it has very long arms. Because if that curvy thing in the middle is the buttock, which I think it must be, uh, then they go down to the knees. And it rather amuses me that um, knuckle trailing is a, an abusive t term which occasionally as applied to things like Neanderthals, although most unjustifiably in my view. And this conception of this demon um, had the idea that very long, long, long arms, which have about them a certain sense of horror. So we're lucky to have these two do um, documents. They are like a snapshot of what was in the mind of the exorcist who was doing this job for a client. And once in a while, we have something else. Now, this tablet is turned on its right as well, and you can see two or three lines of writing on the right. But actually, imagine, if you will, that if you go all the way right, there's about 30 lines of inscription. In other words, this is the bottom of the tablet. And at the bottom of the tablet, the scribe has drawn this goat animal um, standing up um, with strong muscular legs and a tail, and I don't know what... Um, else because i think uh it, it's it, it's unfortunately like all these things uh, patchy where it's most important but this also is a likeness of the evil which in this case was called it causing migraine so this goat-like figure um it's nothing to do with the goat representing the devil in later medieval thinking but this is a conception of the goat perhaps that the butting of the horns cause injury in the head or something of the kind that they attributed to it but here again tucked at the bottom there is this rather revealing picture which it will be easy to overlook in the excitement of reading the inscription so we have two sides at work. We have the benevolent side, which is exemplified by this lion-headed figure from an Assyrian relief who's got a magic dagger. And this is a man, I think, of course, dressed in, in with, with his headdress. The red paint survives, which is remarkable. It's one of the Assyrian war reliefs. And he is a benevolent member of the pro-humanity anti-evil brigade. And the dagger is not just any old dagger that you might use in a brawl on a Saturday night, but it is a weapon charged with great power from literature, from religious texts, from associative ideas, so that the brandishing of this dagger would be sufficient to terrify any demon who tried to resist. And on the right, we have one more tablet with a drawing, and don't run away with the idea they're very commonplace, because they're not. This one is also from a spell, and the scribe has done a drawing at the bottom of the character. Now look, he's got some kind of headdress, upraised arms, a long tail, a tunic on. The arms are held up in front of the face. And this would just be another one of these things, except we know what his name was. And his name was Mimalemnu. And Mimalemnu means any evil. So there were so many of these um, demons and devils that the exorcists had to have lists of them that they could recite whether you are one of these or one of those or a 
Natuku or Nahazu or any of those Rabitsu, those well-known things. And when they were making a list in exorcism, he says, whether you are that or that, I know who you are, I'm driving you out. As an afterthought, they said, or any other evil, just in case they left one out. And with the passage of time, in a uniquely Mesopotamian way, the conception of any evil became an evil entity in its own right, to the point that someone could make a drawing of it like this for an exorcist colleague, if necessary, to make a clay model, perhaps about this high, of the figure to be placed next to the bed or some operative point to drive out, uh, um, to, to be driven out, we know who you are, we treat you, maybe we stick a needle through you, we get rid of you, any evil is now under our control. And they were able to do a drawing of it. And it is actually a very noticeable thing that all the figures on one side or the other have very strong characteristics in common. Now, um, it is certainly true that the bulk of the names of demons which are reeled off in a spell often cannot be identified with an image. Um, sometimes we know nothing about them apart from the fact they were horrible and dangerous. But this demoness on the left is a very famous one. She's called Lamashtu, and she was um, the demoness par excellence who attacked pregnant women and newborn babies. And she also is Leonine, you will see, with an anthropomorphic body. She has claws on her feet and she's clutching snakes. She's suckling a, a wolf and a dog. She's riding on the back of a donkey. This is the fearful Lamashtu. And Lamashtu was once the was the daughter of Anu, um, the great god Anu in heaven. And she did something very bad indeed, and we've never found out quite what it was. So she was banished to the underworld, and full of resentment, she was decided to get her own back, and whenever she could, she would go down the street, um, sniffing for the presence of a new baby or something, and stop outside a house and slip through the door jam and go for the mother or the new baby. And there are lots of spells about this. The Arshapu would know what to do. One of them was that you you make a little boat and you put a figure of Lamashtu in the boat together with things that she would like for the journey. So you can see in the background of this amulet, there's a comb and pots of unguents and other things like this, things that ladies like, so to speak, were given to the Lamashtu figure in her boat and to be carried away down to Elam, and Elam down the river at high speed and never to be seen again. So Lamashtu was something which everybody really believed in. And that is the reason why I put this Hollywood picture up next, not to give you sleepless night, but to show you with the ghastly imagining of some American filmmaker, um, the sort of uh, thing that the Mesopotamians actually envisaged. Not at all a glib um standing in for a, a reference or a symbol of something it was to do with blood and death and the smell of it and injury and pain and this figure although not exactly the match to in every detail i think is a useful thing to convince people um, if they never see this sort of material in antiquity and if you see it in a museum it's always one color and it's dead and there's a boring label and all that kind of thing and you don't think there's anything to do with passion and violence and life and death well there jolly well was and the reason is that Lamashtu um was the personification of um of child mortality because in ancient Mesopotamia it was undoubtedly very common for um children to die soon after birth or in, in infancy and mothers to die when the, the delivery was went disastrously and no one knew what to do and so for everybody um in that culture childbirth was a time of dread of course nothing has really changed about that in many parts of the world but in this case it was certainly true and Lamashtu was in Mesopotamian iconography and philosophical, th theological thinking, the personification of this fear shared by everybody at the most vulnerable times. And you hung this up on the bed, sometimes you had a necklace, and if it was there, um, it would help you to dissuade her from coming in. 
I said there were lots of marvelous um, amulets. We got, I brought you a couple of pictures because they're really rather beautiful things. This is made of obsidian, which is volcanic glass. And you can see the uh, fine leonine figure of Lamashtu. And look at the staring eye above the gaping mouth and the two animals which are with her. The comb is a bit clearer and various other bits and pieces. And the writing is very beautiful, um, spread around. Um, uh, highest quality cutting and a very, very costly kind of thing. And I'm sure as a result that the person who had that in their bedroom felt perfectly safe that Lamashtu would leave them alone, maybe even taken aback by the beauty of the representation of her. And these are a few other things rather similar. What I particularly wanted to show you was the one on the right, which is made of, I don't know what kind of rare stone, absolutely marvellous flecked red thing. And if you look you can see at the top there are drawings and then there's a line and the writing begins. And if you look carefully at the beginning of the first line, which is here, if that works on the screen, that is that same sign, whoops, pardon me, that is the same sign which we were talking about at the beginning, the sign for incantation, Shu plus the, the uh, divine sign. So there it is at the beginning of the incantation to say, this is an incantation, and then it attacks Lamashtu. And sometimes the writing is beautiful. The one on the lower left is very ropey indeed. You can see the perfunctory carving of the boat, which is the sort that found its way in the southern swamps among the reeds. And she's got bits and pieces. She's a little overweight, Lamashtu, there, a little portly, I think. Um, it looks like she might have had rather more babies than she really merited. Anyway, that's and the thing about it, you see the little flap at the top. There was a hole through there, and it would be worn on a lanyard round the neck of the nursing mother, or perhaps suspended somewhere. And the other thing to, you might find interesting is this tiny mould, the stone mould on the left, was used to make bits of jewellery and also a small Lamashtu amulet, which has in it the boat and the figure and upraised arms and characteristic form with some kind of flounced ballet tutu, it looks like. And, and that mould shows how commonplace such things were that you would, when the time came, you might nip out to the market and buy half a dozen lead things for a couple of pennies instead of using very, very expensive stone like the one, that red stone must have cost a king's ransom or obsidian, which is also very pricey. So things were available to people who had not much money who wanted the same thing for the same reason. Now, while we're on the subject of childbirth, I can't resist um, discussing this with you just for a moment because I'm sure everybody here has seen The Exorcist, that well-known film. If you haven't seen The Exorcist, that well-known film, I would say don't, because it is really quite upsetting. And most, I mean, not, not for a man like myself, but for sensitive persons could be a little overwhelming. Anyway, the point I wanted to make here is, firstly, that um, on the right, under the lamp, you see um, um, an Arshipu, an exorcist, in modern dress. So this is a Roman Catholic priest who's been dispatched to the house where the girl on the left is exhibiting a whole cycle of unpleasant traits to do with being possessed by a demon in order to use the emoluments of the Catholic inheritance to drive out the demon just as a Babylonian would have done in the past. The trouble was, of course, that this fellow didn't know any Akkadian and whatever he was using didn't work and so he perished himself as part of this delightful happy story of everyday country folk now the picture up on the left appeared right at the beginning of the um film shows hollywood's conviction that all archaeologists have to wear hats like this and at the beginning of the film this figure this winged itty phallic figure as i believe they describe it it was excavated at the site and according to the un unraveling of this miserable business, that figure was the source of that poor girl's um, distress. Now, the fact is that that figure is known to us as Pazuzu. Is it not on the most beautiful kind? You'll see the fates leering over the top of the picture. That's a jolly good likeness of Pazuzu in stone. Pazuzu was one of us as well. He was on our side.
prosperous matter that Hollywood decided to pick on Pazuzu as the source of this yellow vomit and the head turning round, because I feel that ever since poor um, Pazuzu's reputation has been badly damaged and we must do all we can with t-shirts and publicity to set things right. So this is what Pazuzu really looks like. This is a bronze in the Louvre. And what a fantastic thing that is, the dramatic lighting on our side, but with that glare and that grimace and the theme about it shows that, again, that what you're dealing with is the product, creative artistic product out of the darker side of the human mind, out of articulated fear, apprehension and all those things culminates in a very striking and um, timeless sort of appearance. So in the Louvre, I have to show you this, it's really rather exciting. In the Louvre, we have the scene on the left, which gives you a whole insight into the daily work of an Arshipu. So in the middle row, there is the sick patient on a beer, B-I-E-R. And to the left, there is a um, a, a, a lamp on a stand and then each side of the bed there are priests dressed in fish cloaks which are to do with the cult of um, of Enki um, the god of wisdom and magic that's the priests of him possessed of his knowledge then there's a whole load of lion-headed persons going along rather like an orchestra in the street they are on the side of the good and along the top, there are symbols of the gods and the seven stars, the seven circles of the Pleiades and the winged sun god and the image of Inanna. So at the top rank, the gods are there on our side. And then these lion headed priests and the other priests are there. And then at the bottom, there is a scene of Lamashtu again um, being driven off but into the river. So you can see the river at the bottom is. <laughs> is clearly represented with having fish swimming along. So it's rather a good clue. And there's another lion headed figure there. So this, I suppose, is a woman on the beer. Can only be that, can it not? Lamashtu is being driven out in a very effective way with all this complicated stuff on this metal amulet. And, but the most interesting thing is on the back, you can see that winged figure called Pazuzu is standing and looking over the top going, <laughs> I see you and put, sticking out his tongue. And the point here is this, you put this up on the wall and Lamashtu comes through the door jam, thinks here's a nice juicy bit of stuff and then sees this and sees Pazuzu making that face. It will be so irritating to her that she will lose her appetite and go somewhere else. It's, it's being driven out. So this shows better than anything that Pazuzu is definitely on our side and that amulet um as i i it's just as a close-up it's a rather interesting thing and um you, you can tell by uh, looking at it as if it was real so to speak on a, on on the ground in a house there are two rooms as you might say and my friend strike worked this out sent me a picture of it like this it's very interesting because you can see the lamp and the priests on a sick bed that's room one and then the ones on the right are well-known magical figures behind some kind of screen or in the adjoining room helping out being present and to ensure that everything works out um, I like this sort of idea to take a picture from a modern culture, especially if it's rubbishy and invented with no historical support, because actually it gives you a kind of feeling of stuff like people bent over a figure with vials of stuff on shelves and probably a skull on the top shelf and a rather uncomfortable looking bed. I assume that the patient's still alive, although in this case it might be a corpse, it's a bit difficult to say. So don't take it too literally. But the fact it's so yellowed and crinkly gives it a kind of veneer, more accurate, for example, than the Hollywood version of poor Pazuzu. Another thing they had, miserable photograph, but certainly captures the imagination, is a kind of magic bell. So you can see the same um, array of fish cloak, 
priests and lion-headed figures and surely in the course of a ritual it will be prescribed that the bell will be rung and it wouldn't be just some tinkly winkly thing but probably very resonant and and striking and if in the silence of a room with, with incense and people perhaps wondering muttering under their breath incantations around the sick bed the sudden chime of that thing will be very striking psychologically and drive away perhaps a demon who was lingering unnecessarily and these are little clay figures of these fish priests in fish cloaks and these are um, a rather interesting Mesopotamian idea again they were buried under the floor so you have one of these there under the floor perhaps by the door jam or something like that in your house and if they were there on duty rather like um, soldiers in their busbies outside Buckingham Palace, then the house would be safe because anybody sniffing around with an evil inclination would say, ah, oh, hello, hello. And not only are those figures there, they might not be frightened, but they knew what they stood for and what company they recommended and what they implied about what could be brought against them if necessary. And this is another set of these winged figures. They're a bit ropey and they're kind of mass produced, which I think is another interesting matter that they obviously were produced in a mould so that when there was need for it, one people could get them without them being costly um, in any number necessary. I suppose if you were neurotic, you'd have them in every house, every ground floor room in the house, or may, maybe not. But anyway, they sometimes found, especially in palaces, in the, the large complexes where the royalty lived, in many rooms, they, these are found under the floor as prophylactic devices as it were, connected by an invisible current, A, to the exorcist, the Arshipu, who knew they were there, and also the gods who had all the magic, who were connected to the Arshipu. So they were kind of representatives, not big in themselves, but quite interesting. Now, these are my favourite. Um, there's a whole group of these found together once. Um, this is the clearest photograph I could find. So you see that this mastiff, um, a muscular and dangerous looking animal with its name on in fact there's a whole set look like that and they have their names on like this they say don't think bite that's one of them another one is loud is his bark and the third one is his enemy's captor so they were all sent into their job you can see they've got eyes and teeth and they look ready for anything under the floor with these special catch line phrases which personifies the image they should present offensive dangerous unpredictable and unmanageable so uh what we've been talking about so far the ship twos, the arshipu who used the ship two incantations mostly was concerned with demons and devils and of course our old friend ghosts and that is one big category of the professional's task but there was a second category which is to do with sorcery now sorcery is quite different because it is to be attributed to human hands that is to say what witches and um sometimes in seriology they're called warlocks i don't know whether warlocks is quite the word but you can't say he witches and she witches and wizards is even worse because it sounds like somebody at a children's party so warlocks is an old word so witches and warlocks in other words male and female troublemakers and there's a whole series called maklu which means burning this is one from the assyrian library ruled out in two columns very neatly written with all the spells there and the rituals for it and in fact there were eight such tablets and a special ritual tablet as well explaining the month of abu when this was to be done and all manner of details that the arshipu would need to have at his disposal in order to cope with this sorcery now sorcery um uh another thing it's a common matter in the world not an obscure idea but in mesopotamia it was taken very very seriously especially in the second millennium bc so the idea that uh, there were women uh, um who knew how to make people ill they whisper and point their fingers and they 
make little figurines and brrr, strangle them and do all manner of stuff like that or burn wax figurines of people and all that kind of thing they were a source of big trouble and you know some people have trouble with their neighbors and they spread rumors around in town about them but this is a very ancient matter and in ancient times it was taken very seriously to the point that um when people were ill in the second millennium bc they either believed that they were ill because of the body anyway like you have a stomach ache because your stomach hurts or you have a boil because of the skin or something and if it was something which couldn't be explained where there was no obvious origin for a symptom it was put down to sorcery it was a kind of catch-all thing so if it wasn't something that you'd expect to get that everybody gets you know your grandfather had it your auntie had it and you have it you know you're going to get better if it wasn't something like that, but it was more serious or more frightening, then they thought it was a witch or a wizard who was after them. And two things make this importance very clear. One is this. This is the law code of King Hammurabi of Babylon, um, which is in the Louvre. It's very tall. It's inscribed with 282 separate laws about behavior, about punishment, and about all you need to know to be just and fair of course it's only theoretical but the interesting thing from our point of view is that the very second law out of 282 uh, sentences a witch to death if the charge of witchcraft is proved against them so that is quite a serious matter is quite revealing that there was a widespread ascription to the idea that some kind of ills were due to other people jealous people whisperers calculators plotters all that sort of stuff that was a big um explanatory um that was a big explanation for a whole load of ills and in the first millennium from about 900 bc it's interesting to observe that the attribution in medicine to um, sorcery and witchcraft takes very much a back seat it's kind of reduced down and in its place um, um, ghosts and devils and demons are regarded as being responsible for the same range of problems illness and sickness come from them so to speak supernatural different entirely from things due to natural human beings and i think this evolution is rather revealing and also rather consistent so there was another series of many tablets this time nine called sherpu where things are also burnt and it's again so you see here sins ritual offenses unwitting breaches of taboo offenses against the moral or social order when the patient was unsure what act of omission he may have committed to the gods so it's a whole different thing it it, it is predicated on an understanding of what's right and what's wrong in a sort of moral slightly biblical but not entirely sense which is nothing to do with any of these things being punishment by divine or, or or demonic source and a lot of attention was paid to that in the library there are these nine tablets of the same kind of thing and they are a central part these two activities of what the um uh, exorcist regarded as his daily work so in this maklu thing a couple of examples figurines of the sorcerer in this case uh, the human thing drowned in black liquid and finally placed face down on the ground and crushed while the first four tablets were recited that sounds pretty clear in its approach then you have fumigation of the household which is an important thing with incense and so forth and the massaging the patient while tablets five to seven like 57 were read out for example may their spells be peeled away like garlic and all manner of ritual things give background to the imagery of the spells of reduction and disappearance and finally the self-recognition in a bowl of pure water you are my reflection you are mine and i am yours and may nobody know you and may no evil approach you so the idea being at the end of it you have a sort of immunity from further trouble of the same kind so i wanted to show you this because i'm very fond of these things um 
The tablet in the bottom right hand corner comes from the Assyrian Library, and it's not to do with matters of state or heavyweight deals or really big scale exorcism or anything of this kind. It's part of the uh, Archipu's work. It's to deal with babies who won't go to sleep and who won't shut up and they cry and cry and cry, which is, in fact, for anybody who has had one of those things on their back and patted it walked up and down for four miles in the middle of the night and it still won't do it, it does occasionally lead to the idea of throwing them out the window and what is interesting that this is not a new problem and this tablet is all to do with crying children and what have you and what have you and what you do is you take an amulet um, and put it round the neck and um, that will do the trick. Now, if you look on the left, you will see five um, horrible, murky black photographs of clay amulets of this type. So they are made, they are cylindrical, they have a hole through the middle, and these incantations are written line by line on them, round and round, and these are to be worn on the neck. Now, this um, on, on the colourful picture, you see four more or less equal size ones and one weeny one. Well, I think this is the situation that the first three, the orange one and the two above, are for adults. And perhaps the one above on the left is for an adolescent. And the tiny one is for a baby, because the incantation was addressed to Sirius, in the heavens, which was the abode of Ninurta, the god of war, who was jolly hot against demons and devils, a very good god to have on your side. He was married to Gula, who was the patron goddess of medicine, so a good name to have on your side. And this spell, which is written out in the tablet, it says you write it out on a cylinder of potter's clay and you fire it and wear it round your neck. And we have these examples, and I cannot imagine for the life of me how anybody on an excavation found such diminutive things and rescued them and brought them to modern attention. But it is quite remarkable, and the result of it is we have the official uh, um, document from the um, specialist prescribing these cylinders and five examples of them um, at the same time. I think that is really rather wonderful. And then we have this. So um, the next talk is going to be about medicine, but this is not really medicine. This is really to do with magic because this is to do with toothache. And um, the, ba the Babylonians and the Assyrians had a, a conventional view that toothache was caused by a worm. And uh, this actually is an idea which has never quite gone away. It circles in many literatures and even in these rather interesting medieval, um, rather graphic amulet type, well, rather graphic things. I don't know what you do with that tooth, but um, uh, perhaps, um, hmm. well, anyway, you can see that the, the wormy thing is still alive as a source of toothache. But this spell, um, which is a bit like the one um, for no noisy and unsettled babies is to do with a really common human problem and it's a spell recited by the exorcist and this is how it goes after heaven created the earth the earth created the rivers the rivers created the canals the canals created the swamp and the swamp created the worm the worm went weeping before Shamash, the sun god, his tears flowing before the god Ea. What will you give me for my eating? What will you give me for my sucking? I give you the ripe fig and the apricot. But what use are they to me, the ripe fig and the apricot? Lift me up that I may dwell among the teeth and gums. Blood of the tooth will I suck, and roots of the gum will I gnaw. Then there is this line, which I put in capitals. Drive in the peg and seize the foot, which I can only imagine is what the Archipu said to the barber 
surgeon or equivalent who was going to, if necessary, remove this tooth or take drastic action, that is the instruction to him. And then the exorcist says, uh, because you said this so um, may Aya strike you with his mighty fist. Thank you.